All right, everyone. So today I'm going to be presenting a cadaveric study, which is a characterization of the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. And we are looking at its clinical application for autologous breast reconstruction. As you can see here, I had a wonderful team of research assistants, as well as some stellar faculty to guide me through this process. A brief little introduction. Today, we are talking about breast cancer and breast reconstruction. As you may know or not know, breast cancer is the second most common type of cancer in the United States. However, it is the leading cause of cancer amongst women worldwide. Within the United States, one in eight women could develop this diagnosis of breast cancer within their lifetime. And the incidence has actually been increasing about 0.6% each year since 2013. When a patient is diagnosed with breast cancer, along with the chemotherapy and radiation they may receive for treatment, another option that they have is mastectomy. And mastectomy involves the removal, surgical removal, of any and all necrotic tissue and neoplastic tissue within the patient's breast in hopes that that will wall off the spread and invasion of breast cancer. When the patient is left post-mastectomy, they may suffer a lot of different emotional and physical complications. They did just go through a very large surgery that left them without their womanhood, you could say, as they lose their breast tissue, but also a lot of the emotional aspects that go along with that. They may then choose to undergo reconstruction surgery, which comes in one of two types. The most common being the implant-based reconstruction. As you can see by the stat, 54.4% of individuals within 2022 chose to undergo this implant reconstruction, which involves an expander to stretch the skin and then the placement of either a silicone or a saline implant. But trends recently have been trending towards what is known as autologous breast reconstruction, which is actually the reconstruction of the breast using donor tissue from the same individual. For instance, they could take skin, adipose tissue, and muscle from the abdomen, the posterior thigh, or even the back region. And those come in two varieties. They can either be a pedicle flap or a free flap. And we will discuss those on the next slide. This is a pedicle flap procedure on the left. What a pedicle flap does is it maintains its blood supply. So when we are performing these reconstruction conserges, when surgeons are performing these reconstruction procedures, it is of the utmost importance that they maintain blood supply to that tissue. Otherwise, the tissue could become necrotic and eventually not good for a reconstruction. So a pedicle flap maintains that blood supply. It just twists that blood supply on its axis so that way it can reach the chest wall. Whereas with a free flap procedure, we are surgically removing that tissue and then reattaching it to the chest wall. With the free flap, it is going to be a longer surgical procedure and you will have two separate sites of um, surgery. So that can result in other complications due to infection rates or the healing process. But the good news with using autologous breast reconstruction is that surgeons can also turn their attention to maintaining breast sensation. When a woman undergoes a mastectomy and then has reconstruction using an implant, a lot of the time we are, do not need to save the blood supply or the nerve supply. But with an autologous breast reconstruction, we have to save the blood supply. And in recent years, there has been a call for surgeons to also take nerve from that donor site and then reattach it onto the chest wall so that the donor may have breast sensation as well as nipple and areolar sensation. That's the main focus of our presentation. And the free flap that we are going to be focusing on today is known as the profunda artery perforator flap. This flap, as you can see here, is actually taken from the posterior thigh, just below the gluteal region, removed and grafted onto the chest wall. It is then attached to intercostal arteries and nerves. But with this, it gets its name because it is relying on the arterial supply from the profunda artery, 
also known as the deep femoral artery for all you anatomists out there. And this flap is defined by the iliotibial tract and the gracilis muscle laterally and medially, as well as the inferior gluteal crease superiorly. Now the inferior gluteal crease is a structure that we can see in living individuals as the gluteal muscles make this indentation or this fold underneath the gluteal region. However, in cadavers and our deceased individuals, we do not have this inferior gluteal crease. So therefore we created a grid system to help take this into account. Uh, as you can see, the flap itself is of an elliptical shape and it extends about six to seven centimeters inferiorly on the thigh. Well, you may ask, we know what the blood supply is. It's the profunda artery perforator flap, but what nerves lie within this region that we could potentially graft? This left image here shows you the cutaneous or the sensation component of all the branches that lie within the leg and the thigh posteriorly. And I would like to draw your attention to the purple region. The purple region is supplied by the posterior cutaneous nerve or the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. And you can see that it very closely lines up with the pap flap region as was discussed previously. The right image is a schematic that was created to show you where the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve is. And it lies just medial to the sciatic nerve as it follows the backside underneath of that muscle there known as the piriformis muscle. Now we know that the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve is a cutaneous branch off of the posterior femoral main trunk, but also keep in mind that this nerve supplies the gluteal region as well as the perineal region. So there you can see the cutaneous branch and we are going to be focusing on the even smaller branches that come off of that. So what is our project goal? Our project goal and hypothesis was to characterize that posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. Where are the branches? What are their size? Is there a noticeable pattern? And then we also wanted to assess those measurements to determine if this nerve could be used for those autologous breast reconstruction procedures to give women back sensation due to the reconstruction process. Uh, now we will focus on exactly which methods that we followed. So within our lab, we actually used 23 lower extremity specimens, which came from 15 of our formalin embalmed donors. These donors included seven male donors and eight female donors. And the breakdown also included 10 left limbs and 13 right limbs. Any donor that had a known surgery to their lower extremity, or if we noticed surgical scars, we did go ahead and exclude those from our sample size. The average age of our donors were 73 years old. Besides specimens, we also wanted to follow a dissection procedure that closely matched that of the profunda artery perforator flap procedure that they would use in breast reconstruction. So to do this, we had our patient lying prone, we did go ahead and mark our borders as defined. And then we used this grid system because we did not have an inferior gluteal crease in many of our donors due to the preservation process. So because of that, we wanted to create a anatomical based grid system so that all of our measurements would have a consistent variable to compare them between. So we went ahead and we palpated the greater trochanter, the tip of the coccyx and the PSIS and we placed T-pins there. We then drew using wax screen, wax string, a horizontal line and a vertical line as this image shows, and where they overlapped perpendicularly, we referred to that as our anatomical landmark intersection. And I will definitely be referring back to that when I get to measurements, so keep that in mind. This is a progression of exactly how we performed our methods. We marked our borders and we actually dissected down to the deep fascial layer where we reflected from a lateral to medial direction. We then used 3.5 loop magnification to locate the teeny tiny branches that lied within that pat flap region. And we marked them each with a different colored pin as image B suggests. From there, we then go, did, went ahead and removed all of the overlying tissue in the gluteal regions so that we create 
we could create that grid system and find our anatomical landmark intersection for which measurements could be taken. After our measurements were taken, we then retro dissected, which means that we followed that nerve and all of the branches that we identified back to the main posterior femoral cutaneous trunk as image D suggests. Now this slide can be a little bit daunting. These are all the measurements we took, but in summary, we wanted to figure out how many branches lied within each pap flap region. Also, what was its diameter? What was its length that you could identify? What was its length heading back to the main trunk? And then in relationship to the posterior thigh, we also used image J and pictures that we had taken to determine if those branches originated in the medial or the lateral aspect of that pat flap region. Another key component is we wanted to compare our stats in laterality. So we had seven donors out of our main 15 donors that had their left limb and their right limb included in the study. So we compared all of our measurement means to each other to figure out if there was a predictable pattern within an individual from left and right limb specifically. And we did this using two-tailed t-tests. So let's discuss exactly what we found within those two-tailed t-tests and specifically characterization of the nerve in general. So our characterization table here is for all 15 donors that we dis did dissect in all 23 limbs. I wanna point out those purple tables on the right. There were 79 individual branches found within the pat flap region. However, only 75 of which originated from the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. Four actually belong to the inferior gluteal nerve, which just goes to show that the pat flap region can potentially be supplied by various nerves. And the fact that we chose to select the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve for characterization is of more importance as it does supply the majority of the flap, but other nerves in the area could be used for similar procedures. We also identified that 22 of them originated just medial to the posterior thigh midline, whereas 45 were lateral. Uh, based on this data and only our limited number of samples, it would be safe to assume that you can find the majority of the branches within that lateral aspect. Another key finding here is that in terms of branch number, there was anywhere from one to seven branches in each pat flap region. However, an average of 3.26 were found per region, which is promising. You know that you have approximately three branches to choose from as a surgeon to follow back and use as a potential graft. We then compared lateralization in those seven donors that had their left and right limbs included. And we found that within the right limb, there were 45 branches accounted for and the left only 22. So based on this stat alone, you might start to think, well, the right limb is going to have more branches. But again, that is a limitation of our study, not having quite as many samples, but it is an interesting trend to keep in mind. The data table on the right side of your screen actually breaks down each of those seven donors, their left limb and their right limb, as well as the mean measurements for each of those. So we use this data then to create our statistical analysis table, which will be shown here. And with this, you can see that only one of our values highlighted in red there actually came out to be statistically significant. Statistically significant basically means that when we were comparing our means between the left and the right limb, we noticed that within that one length of branch emergence back to its main trunk, that was the only value that showed there was a key difference between the individual's left and right limb, which means for the others, there was not a strong difference that was notably present to make you think that we should have preference for one limb over the other. I do want to highlight here that the branch diameter was just slightly greater in the right limb amongst these individuals, whereas the branch length extending out of the deep fascia was actually slightly greater in the left limb. The length extending out of the deep fascia, the only real clinical significance for that is for 
the surgeon identification of these nerve branches so that they may follow them back. But as they follow them back, you'll notice that it was also greater on the left limb with a mean of 122.16 millimeters in the left limb, as opposed to the 81.21 millimeters in the right limb. So ideally, if looking at this data as a surgeon, you could argue that, oh, in these specific donors, the right limb had larger diameter possible, whereas the left limb may have preference for length. Diameter and length are of utmost importance during this coaptation or the grafting of a nerve from one location onto the chest wall because you want to make sure that the diameter is great enough that you have enough room to surgically suture on one end of the nerve to another. Whereas the length is important because you want to make sure you have roughly 50 millimeters worth of length available for you. So that way you can have a tensionless graft and that the nerves can have time to grow without tension and then provide sensation ultimately. There are some limitations of our study and I've actually highlighted the majority of them. The sample size of only 23 limbs. It is relatively small, although it is a great increase to the last previously performed study, which only included 10 limbs. We also had the limitation of the fact that our donors lacked that inferior gluteal crease, but we did try to use our grid system to like, counteract that limitation. There's also a known shrinkage of nerves in arteries within embalmed donors due to the process of them being in our lab and just drying out. In conclusion, we can say that we did successfully characterize the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve and its branches, specifically in the location of that pap flap. However, our data and our statistical analysis showed that there is not a consistent pattern with in the PFCN location or its branch characteristics. Besides that, though, this indicates that before a surgeon attempts this procedure, it's always good to perform a pre-op visualization study. We use pre-op visualization such studies all the time to make sure that we have proper arterial supply, but we could say the same for our nervous supply if we are going to prioritize the saving of these nerves and the grafting of them to provide sensation. We also notice that the non-significance is actually pretty clinically reassuring as long as the surgeon performed this procedure in a very careful and stepwise manner so that they can identify the nerve branches and adequately and feasibly use those nerves to graft. The lack of an appreciable and consistent anatomical branching pattern was not necessarily predicted based on our hypothesis, but it does support the need that we have branches that are viable for this procedure. You just have to be very strategic on how you approach this procedure. Besides that, I would like to acknowledge my research team that put in many hours to collect these samples in a limited time frame, as well as all the advisors on faculty who have helped me with statistics, and specifically Dr. Tony Olinger. He created some of the images that you saw today to help explain a lot of the different nerves, as well as the pat flap itself, and then ultimately, the donors get the most uh, respect and acknowledgement here because without them, we would not be able to continue doing these many cadaveric projects and learning and applying it into the clinical field. Other than that, if anybody has any questions, I would love to try to answer them.